Hey everybody, it's Carl Killo with GetSortedLiveFree.com. I want to tell you about my personal experience with Jordan Peterson and especially bringing Rule 8, tell the truth, or at least don't lie, into real active conscious being in my life. And it is one of the most powerful things I've ever experienced, and I want to share that with you now. To begin with, what I want to start is a pers with, this is a personal story because I believe this is very key and I'm going to share something with you that is going to make you go, dear God, Carl, how can you just say this stuff to the world? Aren't you scared? Aren't you afraid of saying things like that or of being judged by everyone else? Really good feeling to have, very understandable. And no, I'm not afraid. Now, I'm not afraid because I've seen what happens when I stop lying and when I tell the truth as much as I can. And it would go like this for me. I'd meet someone new and I'd be, I'd, and I'd, I'd approach them this way. What can I do to please you? And instead of, well, let me tell you about me. And because I was so concerned with the, let me make you happy, that I would twist my own truth and lie to tell you what you think you might want to hear. And that was unbelievably conceited. One, it assumes I can read your mind and know what you're all about, and I can't. And two, well, then you never get a chance to really know me. And then I have to remember which face I put on to talk to you. What's the face that made Danny happy? What's the face that made my wife happy? And if I get those rules mixed up, which face I'm supposed to wear in front of the person that I'm talking to, I'm spending more time living out an act rather than speaking the truth in a way that feels very right and real to me so that you can understand me. This is the game that we play all the time. We worry about the faces that we put on for each other because we understand how vulnerable each one of us really are. We understand what would hurt us. And so we're very careful about what would hurt that other person. And so we, we lie to keep from hurting other people. But it's really, some, it's really more of a self-defense mechanism because it goes something like this. If I don't tell you something that makes you uncomfortable, you're not going to tell me something that makes me feel uncomfortable. And then we can just have a superficial conversation and go about our lives. Except that that eats your soul. And I was living my life that way for a very long time. Let me give you an example. So I became a teacher two years ago, and I was very proud of this accomplishment. And I did my best to get a job at a school that I thought very highly of. And as I began to go through the school year, I was obviously dissatisfied with something because I was drinking an awful lot, like an awful lot, to the point of numbness and tingling when I would go on multi-day benders. And it would be very painful. And I knew I was running from something, but I couldn't even admit that I was trying to escape from something. There was some pain, some fear I didn't want to experience. I didn't want to be true. I was running from the truth. And the truth was that I truly had huge expectations for the new institution where I was going to teach. And those institutions 
sorry, that that institution did not meet my expectations. And I had a deep desire to teach. And I really thought that that was going to be the place. And I really didn't want it to be true that that was not going to be the place. So what happened? I didn't want to do the job, at least at a subconscious level. I enjoyed the teaching. I loved the people that I taught. I hope some of you are watching now. It was an amazing experience. But the problem was, I had set up this as being the pinnacle of what would make me happy. Teaching there would make me happy, period. It would just happen. Without any more examination or wondering why. And when that turned out not to be true, there was a voice in the back of my head saying, you're not happy. And I didn't want to hear it. And because I didn't want to hear it, I'd drink. And because I drank, I did my job in a very non-productive way. That could have ensured that I, if I'd wanted to, I could have kept the job. What happened was that I was told that I would not be teaching at this institution next year. And I reacted poorly to it. I was angry. I asked for explanations why. And they were unable to give me any, which made me angrier. So, what did I do with that? Well, I took a, def a few days to think about it. And I came to the conclusion that if for whatever reason I was doing the job so poorly that I didn't care enough to demonstrate my value to those around me, even to the extent that someone from the hiring pool, a random person, would look better than me, then I had a lot to work on inside of me. And so I got busy. The offer was extended to me to, you may teach here through the end of the year, but be aware that you will not be invited back. And my response to that was, if the offer that I understand you are making to me is money for my soul, no, thank you. I'm going to go work on my soul because something is not right. So, I got myself into some AA meetings. I found the power of being able to share myself fully inside of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was surreal and healing to an extreme in a way that you can't quite imagine. If you go in and you tell the truth, and in, in spite of there being you know, 10, 20 other people looking at you, waiting to hear what you have to say. I decided I was going to tell the truth. I was going to speak of the things that I was not proud of, so that I could begin to examine them myself. And when I spoke them to a room full of people who were also hurting and suffering, I wasn't judged. I was met with kindness and nods of understanding. And that was powerful. And also addicting in a way, because I'd never felt anything like that really before. I was telling the truth. I was talking about me. And other people weren't attacking me for it. They were thanking me. And so I wanted to talk more. And an interesting thing would happen. and I, I would share, and you go around the circle and share in Alcoholics Anonymous, and you tell your story, and 
and you could see the the depending on how the people were that were sharing, they would still have their mask up and didn't want to open up all the way, because opening up all the way to another person is at least one pathway to opening up to yourself so that you can really look at yourself and see the things that you need to really excavate out of you and take an honest look at and go, why am I doing that? What am I scared of? And so I'd wait for my turn. And I would really want to say something about myself that was going to help other people heal themselves. And so I would share, like I'm sharing with you now. And I'd tell the truth. And then other people were not scared. Because they saw I wasn't scared. And we could be vulnerable and not have fear of being stabbed in the heart by someone who didn't understand because everybody in that room understood everybody on that room was trying to avoid their own personal trip down to hell or to climb up out of Hades and so the shares after me I learned some amazing things, valuable things, personal, private things, things that are held inside and locked away in the heart, in a tiny chamber where they spread their roots of rot and corruption and turn your spirit dark. We shed the light on each other in those meetings. And it healed us. It healed us very well. And it got us on the road towards understanding each other. So, I tell the truth. I act out the truth. I act in a way that lets me tell the truth more comfortably. I don't lie. I remove the situations from my life that would force me to want to lie. Now, that I've told you that about myself, I hope you will see that it's not such a terrible thing to open your heart to the world, even though there will be those out there whose hearts are so dark, who are suffering so bad, hurting so much, that they will want to throw knives at you and slip the tip in just when you're at your most vulnerable. I'm not scared of you because you can't hurt me. I was once you. And I want to share what I have learned. Rage and scream while you must. But it is the darkness of your own heart that makes you unable to understand that makes you want to manipulate others rather than dig inside of you and do the work in the one place you can actually accomplish it. Look inward. Stop lying to yourself. Tell the truth to yourself and be kind to yourself. Yeah, you did some crummy things. They're hard to look at. It's okay. It's okay. We've all done them. We're all sinners.
Now I would like to see what happens as I read Mil a, a selection from Milton Friedman's Sorry, Milton Freeman's. <laughs> yeah, that just lets you go on my, uh, you know, what my where my political leanings are. <laughs> well, Freud was doing us all a favor there. Hey, I'm not going to cover that one up either. I'm going to let it go. So this is from John Milton. It's uh, Paradise Lost. And I believe this is one of those rare moments of truth where a creative individual has aligned themselves properly with the world or the stream of consciousness or God, whatever your word for that is, and then is able to create something that spans time. And this is one of those things. Farewell, happy fields, where joy forever dwells. Hail, horrors, Hail, infernal world, and thou profoundest hell, receive thy new possessor. This is a statement of willingly letting go of the paradise available to you on earth, around you everywhere, from every living person. If you but embrace it. Or you can go to the place where you know you have control. Inside. And you can lie to yourself forever. You can be the master of your own inner hell. And it will lead you to drink. And to numb your own pain. Until you look at what it is you're actually ruling over. And look around you for a way out. Receive thy new possessor, one who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. You, in your own personal hell, will not be changed. You will change the world rather than look inside, because you're champion there. And time has no hold over you, or so you think. The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven or a hell, a heaven of hell. Can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. Whatever you hold inside of you is the burden you place upon yourself, and it can be light. Or it can be heavy and hard. What matter where if I still be if I still if I be still the same, and what should I be all but less than he whom thunder hath made greater? We're all somewhat lost, wandering through the world, and there's only one thing that you can control the inside. And you, if you remain the same, you will always approach the world in the same way and view it the same way. And the same pains will always be there. And they will continue to harm you, even while you reign sovereign, disconnected from everyone else. Here at least we shall be free. The Almighty hath not built here for his envy. Here you are free from control, from the forced way you must interact with others, because it's really not forced, it's a perception in your mind. And everything that Milton is talking about here, he's talking about God. The Almighty... God didn't give you this personal space inside of you to be jealous about. He said, that's yours for you to figure out. And if you figure it out, you find God. 
God will not drive us hence. He won't push us out of our hearts by force. He won't take a hold of your soul. He will just be there when you release your reins of power over your own inferno. Because it will always only be personal and you'll never create a real connection with anyone else. Ruling only over your own heart. Here we may reign secure and in my choice I get to choose inside me. No one else has a chance to influence what should be in here because you will protect yourself and never let the wall down to let other people in. And then you can feel safe. But that false sense of security slowly eats us away. To reign is worth ambition though in hell. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. Hell is within us. We open up to the world. We open up to creation. We open up to God. And there are rules that we have to live by. No one can force you to accept those rules. Because if they do, you will be bitter and resentful of them. And you will only ever get to reign over your own personal hell, rather than experience the glory of a true connection with other people that heals. That makes you whole. God commands us to love thy enemies. And Jesus says in Matthew 5, 44, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You must love your enemies because they are suffering the same pain as you and you understand that very well. And if you give them a reason to stay within the Hades and the flames of their own creation, inside their own soul, they will never leave and experience the love that is the connection that is shared between us all and the light that shines between every human being when we but tell the truth and let ourselves be vulnerable and do not hide and are not afraid to share what we truly are and what we truly believe. Love your enemies and let them come out of their cage renewed and no longer your enemy. I think the clinical psychologist Carl Rogers was really on to something in his therapy, and this is what Dr. Jordan Peterson uses in his own practice, Then I find it to be very true, because it's true and it makes everyone able to heal each other. And there's nothing particularly special about a clinical psychologist other than he understands people so well that he can look at you and go, man, I get it. And you're hurting and you're angry and you're scared. And I want to help you. I'm not angry at you for saying those things because that is suffering and I don't want you to suffer anymore. So Carl Rogers said his Technique was unconditional positive regard, and this is love by enemies, love everyone. It means caring for the client, but not in a possessive way, or in such a way as simply to satisfy the therapist's own needs. 
If I approach the world looking to satisfy a particular need of my own, and I have to be very mindful of what my need is, one of my greatest needs is to not be hurt. We can hurt each other very easily. And we don't want to make other people angry because that could provoke them to actual harm. It also, but that doesn't happen very much anymore, so why do we lie to each other so much? I think it's because our words have become the thing that with which we shield our soul from the world. And so words can feel like real physical weapons. This is not a reason to change what you say to people. Tell them the truth. Love them anyways for the reaction that they are going to give you. Because they're hurting and scared and fearful just like you are. And somewhere it's got to stop or else we will send ourselves straight into literal hell on earth by fighting, never listening to the other side, and having no regard for the person across the table and where they are and what they might become if someone just said to you, I understand you, and I love you, and I disagree with what you're saying right now, but you need to say it, and I need to hear it, and then you need to hear what I've got to say, and then I'm going to hear what you've got to say, and we're not going to pretend, and we're not going to play this game of, I'm going to call you names because you're hurting me. I know you can hurt me, and I know I can hurt you. Let's be very aware of that, and realize we're not out to harm each other, but we must speak the truth. We must present ourselves to the world so that the world may evaluate the things that we hold to be true. And then we can get information back from the world and from those who love us and from those who care and from those who are really not out to manipulate you but just want to see you healed. It means caring for the client as a separate person with permission to have his own feelings and his own experiences. Humans, I believe, are profoundly connected. And the more we tell the truth and do not act out of fear to protect ourselves, the more other people around us feel free to do the same. And then we really get down to the things that matter. And conversations become profound and important and life-changing. And there's nothing to fear. This is why I became a Christian. I was a militant atheist for a very long time, long enough to rot a good chunk of my soul that I'm working on right now, which is why I'm sharing this with you, because I never understood, and people that are dubious of faith, as I was, should be, because they don't know. They've never experienced it. John 1.1, 1, 1, the Word of God and the creativity of man. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We have a piece of God inside of us, and He comes out every time we speak the truth. The same was in the beginning with God. This has been true forever, and it has never not been true. All things were made by Him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Well, this goes back to Carl Rogers. What he found was that people who were free and did not act through out of force or fear 
who opened themselves fully because they knew those around them truly loved them, were able to be creative in a way that made who they were shine through in the work that they do. And that's why you have things like John Milton that span and last for time, all time. They become eternal when you align yourself with that part of you that is attuned to God. That's what it feels like. I don't know whether it's real or not, but I have faith that it is and I believe. And that's what makes it powerful. I believe that I will never understand, but I know it's right. All things were made by him. All things were made when you align yourself through God. And without him was not anything made that was made. Things made that are imperfect are rejected by those around us who are living their lives, moving forward through time, looking for things that are the most valuable and useful to them. You align yourself with God, then you get feedback from the world in a way that lets you produce something of great merit and great value. And you love doing it as I love doing this. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. When you come to believe, you shine the light of men upon men, and God comes through you and heals and allows creativity and creation. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehend it not. Those who do not have enough light in their hearts do not understand the light that you can bring through being aligned with God. Because everyone is different. Everyone gets their own unique connection to God. If you but seek it, and you must not lie to yourself and be scared of yourself because the peace of God that is inside of you is busy tapping you on the shoulder saying, please, won't you listen? You know it to be true. Just listen. And he will take care of the rest. <laughs>